Welcome to Psych Talk. Um, I'm Dr. Schwartz. Today we're going to talk a little bit about PTSD. In light of the shooting in uh, Germany, I think it makes sense to talk about PTSD today. And PTSD has been with us as human beings as long as, well, as long as we've been uh, human beings. Um, but it hasn't been recognized specifically uh, for all that long. In fact, um, it's only been named uh, since the 1980 when it was uh, entered into the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that we used. However, as as far back as uh, World War One, certainly we began to recognize symptoms that were initially called shell shock. Soldiers would come home with terrible symptoms of fatigue and tremor, confusion, nightmares. <clears throat> insomnia, and even loss of hearing, loss of sight, um, all sorts of really bad things, which initially w was blamed on repeated exposure to bombs going off nearby. And, and the thinking was that that did something to the brain, which then caused these symptoms. Undoubtedly, that did something to the brain, but probably a lot of what was being experienced was PTSD. Um, a, a doctor by the name of Charles Myers in 1916 um, came up with the idea of shell shock and co actually coined the term. Later, we used names like battle fatigue, that sort of thing, a high rate of, to sort of discern the specific um, disorder are also vulnerable to post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are all sorts of things um, in our lives that can um, leave us vulnerable to that. This shooting, obviously, today is one of those things. And, and here's a list of other things in the general population that can result and, and do result in PTSD. Sexual and physical assault, rape, um, abuse and neglect, either acutely or chronically, natural disasters, auto and motorcycle accidents, either witnessing or being a victim of, sustaining any kind of severe injury, a traumatic birth, so postpartum PTSD can happen, terrorism, um, I don't know if you can hear my dogs, but they're making a racket, um, diagnosis of a life-threatening illness, just the... Um, just the experience of being diagnosed with a life-threatening illness can generate uh, very severe PTSD. Witnessing death, and that brings us back. Witnessing death, and that brings us back around to what's happened today. One in three people who experience people who experience a severe trauma will develop PTSD, and that's kind of again what I'm talking about today. So, so this is a very important issue. And on the number of people who were exposed to the shooting today, we can expect. There could be, say there were 100 people in this amphitheater, there's probably going to be 30 odd uh, young people who will develop post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe more depending on the severity and their vulnerabilities and, um, and, and various other factors. So this is a very important issue. And that's only among the students themselves. In a minute, we'll talk about the, all the responders and other people who are involved as well. There are certain risk factors for um, civilians, non-military personnel, that make us more vulnerable to the development of PTSD. Having a history of mental health disorders such as panic, depression, or OCD, having little support from loved ones after an event, experiencing further tra trauma or stress around the event. It's also likely that brain structure, hormones, or other biological factors could play a part in the development of PTSD. Um, we'll talk about these more in another video. Certain factors make PTSD less likely to occur. Things like having a very strong support network, feeling very positive about any actions that you took during the event, and learning to use positive coping strategies to address negative emotions. So one of the things we know is that having access to cognitive therapy directly after the event, brief cognitive therapy, is extremely helpful. PTSD was first, when it was first formally recognized in 1980, it was associated with very severe catastrophic trauma, like I said, like war, 
um, Holocaust survival, torture, rape, atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, natural and human-made disasters, terrorism, and sort of like what happened today. Although even in DSM-5, we do expect that the person has to have been uh, exposed to a catastrophic event. We now know that uh, physical and sexual abuse, chronic physical and sexual and emotional abuse of, of any kind, absolutely can create post-traumatic stress disorder in a person. Really anything that causes uh, a, a threat to the physical integrity um, of a human being, either on an acute or a chronic basis. How does PTSD manifest? What does it look like? What are the symptoms? They're variable depending on the person, but there's a certain cluster of symptoms required in order to have the diagnosis and that you tend to see. One is intrusive recollections, which can come as flashbacks, reliving the event with a full emotional complement associated, or nightmares, um, dreams where you experience the event again and again and again. Something called avoidance, avoiding places, people, events that are reminiscent or that remind you of the event and trigger emotional response. That can cause the development of an I can't mentality. I can't go to the grocery store. I can't go to this social event. I can't go back to school. Um, and obviously that can be extremely impairing to the individual. The onset of negative cognition. So PTSD patients often develop erroneous cognitions about causes and consequences of the event. It's my fault. I caused it. They would have been alive if I hadn't done this, or if I had done that. They can really uh, ruminate on these things and get stuck there and really believe them, causing a lot of guilt, a lot of anger, a lot of depression. Dissociative phenomena. Um, there's, there can be a lot of... Um, feeling of separateness from your body, separateness from your mind. We will discuss these also in future videos. Psychogenic amnesia, so forgetting, uh, not able to remember uh, the time around the event, before, after the event. If that persists, that's concerning. Feeling of being a detached or estranged from others, particularly loved ones. Inability to experience love, pleasure, enjoyment. Increased arousal or awareness, so insomnia, anxiety, hypervigilance, and increased startle response, sometimes frank paranoia. Who is vulnerable? I mentioned earlier that's difficult to say. There certainly are factors that make us more vulnerable and certain factors that make us less vulnerable. We do know that children exposed to long-term childhood abuse, emotional, physical, sexual, are highly likely to develop complicated PTSD. There also do seem to be some neurobiological factors involving size and function of certain parts of the brain, which we will discuss in later videos. There are several different types of stress-related disorders three of which we won't talk about right now, we'll talk about in later videos. That's reactive attachment disorder, diminished social engagement disorder, and adjustment disorder. Beyond the victim of the uh, event directly, others who may be vulnerable to PTSD would be direct witnesses of an event, first responders, including firefighters, police officers, ambulance drivers, uh, paramedics, etc., and relatives and loved ones who are related to the victim or related to the direct witnesses. All those people need to be followed. Treatment, which can be very extensive and detailed, and we will discuss it in, in future videos, in general, includes a particular type of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy, also EMDR, which stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, and also medications, primarily antidepressants and treatment for sleep. That concludes my video, <laughs> mainly because I'm limited by time. I'm going to include the crisis lines and crisis text lines at the end of the video. If you like this video, please like it and subscribe. Thank you.